Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Grow Your Unicorn Silicon Valley event. We have guests from around the world today, from Korea to China to here in Silicon Valley. We have four amazing speakers set up, Sam Wong, Pierre Scruffy, Matthew Lewis, and Paul Kims. Now, I'm going to ask everyone, when you enter the, the group today, please leave your microphone on mute. If you do have any questions for the speakers today, please put uh, direct to me messaging in the chat on Zoom, or if you're on the Korean or Chinese side, if you'd like to talk to your host about it, they will direct message me through WeChat, and I'll be able to ask our distinguished guest today the questions. With that, we have about 30 minutes allotted for each of our speakers today. The first one is Piero, followed by Sam, and then Matt, and we will uh, conclude with Paul. And the format of today, it for most of the speakers, it is very interactive, uh, where the beginning will either be a fireside chat or a presentation with ending, concluding with Q&A from our audience and from some questions that have been submitted to us previously. Now with that, I would like to start off the event by everyone here knows a little bit about TechCode, but just to thank everyone here for attending this event. We at TechCode really appreciate you and we're here to help you, your startups, in many endeavors, whatever you're working on now and in the future. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Piero Scruffi. Piero Scruffi is a former Harvard Stanford professor. He's written one of the most influential books in China. He's the founder of Laser, which I think he can talk a little bit about more. It's established throughout the world. I mean, his presence in Silicon Valley and in the artificial community extends beyond borders. So with that, Piero, please unmute yourself. Please join the group. And if I didn't say anything you'd like to mention to the group, please do so now. And then we'll go right into the first question. Go ahead with the questions. They can right. find out easily about me if they Google my name. So everyone out there, Piero Scruffy does have a Wikipedia page. He does have a website. He is all over the internet, just like you mentioned. And with that, Piero, first question for you. What is AI? There's so many terms that are thrown out there. Hey, when you hear that's, it, that's a, a good question. It's been it's been a good question since the beginning of AI. And yeah, it's, and, and uh, there's never been a, a real definition. Uh, the problem is compounded uh, by the fact that when AI is not popular, nobody's doing AI. When AI is popular, everybody's doing AI. <clears throat> so uh, I always I always mention the case of a, of a good friend, of course, I will not say the name, who has a startup that, that uses uh, statistics. And uh, she changed all, all the brochures that now say machine learning. Um, nothing has changed in the product. It just the brochure says machine learning. Why? Because now AI is popular. So it gets very confusing to decide what is AI, what is not. But on top of that, <clears throat> you have the fact that there are sometimes cultural differences. Um, like in China, I spent a lot of time in China, as you know, and in China, they tend to call AI everything that is automation. Uh, so a robotic arm that simply does this, uh, it's classified as artificial intelligence. Um, <clears throat> why? Because they, they, they missed the 60 years of AI, and so they, they, their, their, their idea of AI is different. Um, so that's uh, that's so that gets tricky. Um, what is simpler is to say what today uh, made AI successful, and that's one branch of uh, traditional AI. It's neural networks. Uh, it's deep learning. Deep learning became very popular in 2012, and that's today is uh, probably a hundred percent of uh, uh, the news uh, uh, you you hear. And uh, it's neural networks, and neural networks are systems that more or less mimic uh, the structure of the brain. So the, the, when we talk AI, uh, uh, at least uh, with me, we're talking about deep learning today. So with that, who is making money in AI? And Piero, I mean, if you were investing in a company right now, would you invest in an AI startup? Okay, let's see if I can share the screen. I can show you. <clears throat> I have a, a couple of data. 
host disable participants three uh, screen sharing. Can you enable screen sharing for me? Otherwise I'll just read them. I'm gonna make you the host, Piero. You're just gonna have to switch it back to me. Are you okay with that? Uh, you can make me co-host, huh? no? Well, you're sharing right now. Okay, good. Okay, don't, don't change anything. <clears throat> can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so this was from last year. I don't have something about this year. It's still early to see the data from this year, but this was last year. <clears throat> And uh, as you see, only four Western and two Chinese AI companies report income. All of them had losses, by the way. But so there's very few companies that actually tell you if, how much money they're making. And this was uh, from um, this publication. Uh, that's uh, just, uh, <clears throat> I picked two. Uh, and what's, what's, first of all, what is uh, typical of these lists, you know, startups, they raise the most money. What is typical of this list that it's a list of companies. Most of them are not AI companies from my point of view. I mean, Vacasa is a vacation rental. Uh, Samsara is Internet of Things and so on. And to find real AI companies, you have to go way down the list. Now, this one is, uh, is also from last year. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's, it's, it's way more reliable. These are mostly really AI companies. We can discuss on a... Uh, Zymergen, which is really biotech. But anyway, and what was interesting last year is that most of the companies that got big funding were Chinese, right? China, 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 <clears throat> and so on. So this year things have changed a little bit. Uh, this is from Crunchbase. So don't compare, I mean, this is like comparing pears and apples because different publications use different uh, uh, sources of data uh, in different, uh, at different time frames, but anyway, <clears throat> it's, it's more or less, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's reliable. So you can see that uh, the funding now has changed a little bit. In the US, there have been some uh, uh, big investments. Uh, I have to say that some of these are, are one investor, like you know, OpenAI, as you know, uh, got a billion dollars from Microsoft. Uh, <clears throat> but you can see that there's more, uh, more investment uh, in, the, in the USA. Now, that said, <clears throat> Uh, I personally think is still, let me, let me stop the sharing. Um, that said, I think the business is still uh, kind of tricky. Um, well, I mean, uh, open uh, deep mind, uh, uh, lost what, 600, I think $600 million last year. Uh, it's probably the most publicized uh, <clears throat> AI company. Uh, it's not clear to me how Google plans to make money. Um, uh, Microsoft must believe that there is money to be made because in um, in uh, July 2019 they invested a billion dollars in uh, OpenAI. Uh, then they announced uh, uh, this supercomputer uh, with how uh, many 200, 300,000 CPUs, uh, presumably with the GPT-3 on board. Um, <clears throat> so Microsoft must think that there is money to be made there. These are big companies. You know, one, one fundamental problem is that the AI we're talking about, deep learning, uh, at the end of the day is data science and it requires really, really powerful uh, machines. And so for an AI startup, uh, it's, it's, it's not trivial to provide uh, um, valuable, just to compete and it's difficult to compete with uh, with the likes of uh, DeepMind and uh, OpenAI. Uh, so that so if the business plan of these big companies is not very clear, imagine the business plan of a startup or a small company. So I'm not surprised that there's, there's, uh, there's not uh, much to talk about. <clears throat> In China, the big success stories, as you know, are face recognition. Um, and, and that's mostly because it's pushed by the government. Uh, in the US, there's, there's investment in, the, in everything that helps the self-driving car. Um, personally, I definitely would not invest uh, in an AI company. I think I would put my money uh, in, in biotech precision medicine, <clears throat> uh, maybe going forward uh, uh, vaccines, who knows. Um, the, the, the business model for AI is still, is still a, little, a little confused. 
And don't forget that some of these things are free. A lot of the, of the software used uh, uh, is open source. Um, so the, 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 the better question is probably uh, who is going to make money using AI? So Zymergen, for example, is a biotech company and it has invested, as far as I know, massively in, uh, in uh, robotics and automation. And so that's an interesting case. You know, can you use uh, AI uh, robots uh, to improve um, the life cycle um, of, um, of making uh, drugs, uh, therapies, and so on? So that's so that that is a different question. You know, then then it becomes just the AI. AI becomes a, a, a competitive factor. So you are in a uh, you are developing some applications and by using AI, maybe you become more competitive than other people who develop similar applications. Then I would invest uh, in a biotech company that is using AI in some innovative way uh, and so on and so on. And maybe that's what Google is thinking, by the way. Uh, maybe AlphaFold uh, is a sign of where the business plan is for them. You had mentioned a moment ago that the business model or business plan of an AI startup isn't really, I guess, thought out there is a little convoluted. Can you go a little bit more into that? Mm, see, I wish, <clears throat> I wish, I, I don't think that, uh, at, at least I haven't seen it. I, I really haven't seen uh, uh, business plans of AI startups that were convincing. Uh, other than business plans that implicitly say, well, I want to be um, acquired by, by a major company. So, so it's, it's, it's hard for me to tell, to say that. That's why I would rather focus on the applications and the applications typically developed by companies that they are not AI companies. They, they, uh, they are, you know, they, they, they specialize in whichever field, uh, law, transportation, financial, medicine, and they have the skills, uh, the, the, uh, the know-how in that field. And by using AI, maybe they will improve their, their products, their competitiveness. So that I see, then and there I could see a business plan, which would be a traditional business plan actually, simply you're using a new technology uh, to uh, beat the competition. But purely AI companies, uh, I think they really, uh, they really have to come up with, uh, with something that I personally don't see. I mean, if you develop a computer vision algorithm, uh, you're competing with the, with, with the people, with companies that already have it. It works pretty well. And that typically requires a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, computational power. <clears throat> Maybe there is more uh, space for hardware AI. I mean, for for chips, for uh, for putting these things on on uh, on chips that don't consume too much uh, power and can be deployed on uh, in inside ordinary devices. But in terms of purely AI, you know, the the mathematical part of AI. I don't know. I, I personally haven't seen business plans that are really convincing. I haven't seen an AI company uh, that I that I can tell this is the next Zoom, this is the next uh, Uber. So with that, right now, during this whole pandemic globally, what has AI done for the COVID nineteen situation? What what new things have you seen with AI during this time? Yeah, let me see if I can find it. <laughs> so. Yeah, <clears throat> let's see if I can share the screen again. I gave a talk not long ago on uh, <clears throat> robots and uh, uh, pandemics. I lost here. Can you see it? Am I sharing? Yep, you're sharing. Okay, let's see if I can. Okay, so these are some slides from that talk. <clears throat> and in that talk, we were talking about all the beautiful things that robots do. But then, in practice, remember when when uh, China, the Chinese built this hospital in ten days, 
who built it. If you blow up the picture, humans, not a single robot. And uh, who took care of the sick people? <clears throat> humans. Um, so the COVID, uh, I, that's it. I don't want to share more, but you got the point. I mean, that the, this pandemic was embarrassing from the point of view of AI. We've had, uh, at least since AlphaGo, that was 2016, we've had four years of hype about uh, the magic of AI, the, the superpower of AI, people talking about the singularity. Then uh, <clears throat> pandemic comes and uh, the only contribution of AI that I can name is when uh, um, a group in Taiwan, fortunately I don't have, I wouldn't find the slides in the next two seconds. A group in Taiwan used uh, uh, an AI system to develop, I believe, antibodies. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's, AI was, was a, it's embarrassing. All this talk about AI and then and then we, we have to rely on, on, uh, on humans. And by the way, we, we ran out of toilet paper. We ran out of, uh, give, me, give me less uh, singularity and more toilet paper. So, so this was embarrassing. Um, and that really tells you, seriously, it tells you the state of the art. It tells you how all the uh, headlines in, in, the, in the magazines, on the websites don't translate into meaningful uh, applications yet. So then with that, I mean, let, let's say that the world does start implementing more AI. What kind of unexpected failures might occur in a world built on, upon AI? Yeah, so, so first of all, I think in general, it's, uh, <clears throat> this is a question really about algorithms. Uh, AI, at the end of the day, AI is computational mathematics. It's AI is algorithm. And uh, we've been moving towards an algorithmic society a uh, long time. <clears throat> this started way before uh, AI became popular. I mean, just think, uh, I don't know, think of your, uh, well, first of all, you're a number. You're a number for the IRS. You're a number for the DMV. Uh, you're a number uh, for your friends when they call you on the phone. Uh, we, we have numbers and we are numbers. Um, uh, second, each of these numbers is, uh, is associated with some kind of algorithm. Uh, typical example, your credit score. I mean, there's some kind of algorithm up there, I don't know, in New York, where it is, wherever it is that these uh, companies reside and that algorithm decides that your credit score is, I don't know, 780. <laughs> So th this, this thing has been, uh, this trend towards the algorithmic society has been around for a while. Uh, by the way, you mentioned the lasers, the, the public talks that are run from Stanford. And on February 25th, I will have uh, a panel on the algorithmic society. I will discuss that with, uh, with three scholars. So that, that goes beyond AI, just the fact that uh, there's increasing use of, uh, of algorithms. Uh, call it AI or not. Now, what the problem, so the first obvious problem is that <clears throat> the ordinary citizen is uh, powerless. Is, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, there's this algorithm up there that decides things for me and I have no control on it. And I think legislation has been very poor from this point of view. Just think of credit score. I mean, it's so difficult to argue with a, with a company that assigns you a credit score. I mean, if tomorrow morning they tell me my credit score is, is has collapsed to 400, uh, what do I do? Uh, it's, first of all, they believe him, they believe it, the algorithm, not me. And then uh, how do I appeal? To this? So th there's, there's something there that, 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 um, that is missing. Uh, second, of course, uh, this algorithm, whether you call them AI or not, makes no difference. These algorithms have, have no ethics, they have no compassion, they have no sympathy. Um, they send letters to dead people asking them to pay, to pay their debt. Uh, uh, so so the, there's the whole ethical problem of, uh, uh, of, of you know, of uh, agents, they're not human. Um, and a second, <clears throat> they can get easily out of control, but I'm more afraid, I think when they, 
get out of control, uh, you pull the plug of the computer and you stop it. Uh, I'm more concerned about the people who have uh, uh, control over these algorithms, who have the power to run these algorithms. Um, the simplest example, of course, is the, um, is the algorithms that make you buy things that you don't need. Uh, in my opinion, a lot of people are getting into debt uh, simply because when they browse, they're constantly bombarded with uh, agents that make them buy things that they don't need. Uh, that's been the number one success story of AI, unfortunately. And then think of the spying. I mean, this is massive. Uh, uh, just for fun, I, 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 we hacked one of the popular browsers on my computer. So it, it tells me when, when the website deploys on a cookie on my computer. And if you do that, it's amazing. I mean, there are some websites that literally deploy hundreds of cookies on your computer. All of them tell you that those cookie, cookies are necessary uh, for the website to function. And in all cases, my little hack removes all the cookies when I leave that website. I have ne never noticed a difference. They're totally unnecessary. They are spying on you hundreds and hundreds of cookies deploy, deployed on your computer all the time. Now, I miss the, the newspaper and the magazine. In the old days, when you were reading the newspaper or reading the magazine, nobody was spying on you. <clears throat> now, the moment you open a website to check uh, what Donald Trump did, somebody deploys cookies on your computer to spy what, uh, what you will be buying, uh, what you will be doing. So there's government and corporations have the power to use these computers, uh, these algorithms, and you don't, you know, I cannot retaliate. I cannot start spying <laughs> what the, the, the CEO of this company does. I cannot start spying on, uh, on whoever deploys cookies on my computer. So that's, uh, that's a, big, uh, a big issue. Um, at the same time, I don't want to be only negative. I mean, algorithms can be very useful. And uh, the, the pandemic is a good example, actually. The, I mean, the mathematical models, uh, unfortunately, were right on target. And we should have, uh, politicians should have listened to them <clears throat> uh, if they only understood math. <clears throat> uh, so algorithms can be powerful, can be useful. Um, that's why I, I, I wrote the book and I collaborated with the Peace Innovation Lab at Stanford. The Peace Innovation Lab studies algorithms that can uh, uh, foster uh, cooperation and trust uh, instead of just uh, <clears throat> uh, spying on you. So, th so there are ways uh, to, to uh, protect yourself from this uh, algorithmic society. I, I feel that we are a little bit in the far west where uh, the people who have the computational power, whether they're governments, corporations, or you know, cyber terrorists. Uh, they can do anything they like. <clears throat> and, uh, and we, we are, don't have uh, enough uh, defenses. So, and this, this, this gets into ethics, as I said, ethics uh, is really difficult to discuss because uh, uh, like it or not, ethics is mostly about uh, punishment. It's not about uh, understanding the judicial system. It's about punishing you when you do something wrong. Uh, it's rare that uh, society rewards you if you do something good. So the, then we get into complicated things and also ethics. You know, <clears throat> I personally think religion is mostly bad. My religious person thinks it's mostly good. Uh, who is right? Uh, but I just think that we should protect the individual more uh, against the power of, uh, of these algorithms. At the very high level, when people talk about cyber terrorism, and they get, they get scared that <clears throat> I think at that level, it's always been a game, uh, the, the cop and thief kind of game where the thief, well, you have to hope the cop gets smarter too. And, uh, and they've been chasing each other since, uh, I think since uh, humans uh, exist. Uh, so I think as we developed more sophisticated systems, there will be more sophisticated uh, cyber terrorists, but they will also be more sophisticated um, cyber defenses. So that is a very serious topic, but I'm less concerned about that. 
So, Piero, with all the talk of terrorists and spying on our privacy, how important is, is ethics play in AI moving forward? That's, I, I really, <clears throat> that's a topic where I would rather not uh, have an opinion. I, I just think um, uh, because, because I'm, I, as I said, ethics is beyond my, um, my, 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 my field. It's, it's uh, such a broader philosophical and, and uh, you know, it's a, a law, it, it just feels that I don't know. The only thing is, I think somebody should be responsible. Somebody should be liable and responsible if a self-driving car kills somebody or causes any damage. Uh, if I touch a <clears throat> biker, uh, forget a pedestrian, a, a child, uh, I'm probably ruined for the rest of my life. You know, it's a major, major thing. And I don't feel, I'm not sure there is the same pressure on the people who build and tomorrow we sell self-driving cars. Uh, somebody, an individual, I want the first name and the last name of the person who will get in trouble if this self-driving car uh, kills somebody. And I don't think today that is the case. Uh, if Elon Musk feels so strong that uh, his self-driving cars uh, will be um, safe, well, maybe he should go to jail. If uh, He should be willing to go to jail if, uh, if the car makes a mistake. And if he doesn't feel comfortable, then he should sell them. So, <clears throat> you know, the, I just feel that uh, uh, we're a bit too eager to let, um, sometimes to let uh, corporation experiment on us. So with that, how will AI systems enhance and augment human creativity? <clears throat> so the, in general, <clears throat> um, I am very happy to be surrounded by intelligent people. I think all my life I try to have uh, sometimes the funny friends, sometimes uh, um, uh, sometimes uh, adventurous friends, but also intelligent friends like you. And the more intelligent the people around me, the more intelligent I become, hopefully, you know? <clears throat> so if you tell me that um, I will be surrounded uh, by very intelligent machines, great. What's wrong with that? Uh, hopefully it will make me more intelligent. Um, what I'm afraid is that I will be surrounded by dumb machines. And that's, to me, that's the situation today. Uh, that's why I called my book, Intelligence is Not Artificial. Uh, what do machines do? The machines have around me, mostly they beep. If I don't fasten my seatbelt, my, my car beeps, uh, my microwave oven beeps, my telephone beeps. Uh, they don't do really intelligent things. So, so, so far, I don't think they have augmented <clears throat> my creativity. Um, as you know, there's computers that make art, and that's an interesting topic uh, because it makes you think what is art, <clears throat> first of all, and uh, I personally don't think it's a, it's a human exclusive, an exclusive uh, human uh, activity. I, I've seen beautiful bird nests, beautiful spider webs, um, and uh, divers tell me of beautiful corals. Uh, that's art. <clears throat> I think uh, sometimes we miss the point here when we talk about creativity. Um, the great thing about art is that we understand it. It's not only beautiful. Uh, in fact, some art is not beautiful. I mean, think of uh, Duchamp's urinal, a famous piece of art that is now in a museum. Um, but we understand it, it relates to us. Uh, so my question is not when computers will, will become creative. My question is when computers will become art historians or art critics. You know, when, when can you put things in perspective? Uh, <clears throat> so, so far, uh, machines are, are tools and we use these tools um, to perform activities. Um, I wish they were more intelligent. Right now, I think most of our creativity still comes from the interaction with, uh, with uh, other people. And, but, but 
at the same time, there is an, an indirect way in which machines are making us more creative. And that's precisely when they are so complex, you have to understand them. So when uh, the moment um, GP3, GPT-3 uh, does something, uh, a lot of us immediately try to figure out how it did it. And then we try to debunk it. It's so, you know, so intuitive, it's so instinctive that you want to prove the machine was not that smart. Well, that indirectly makes that uh, smarter. <clears throat> Let me add one more thing, because this is actually an important topic. I was trying to synthesize uh, something important. Uh, the, 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 the machines we have today do deep learning. And what we humans do is deep thinking. And we shouldn't forget that. There's a big difference between the two. A simple example that I gave, I gave a talk at Stanford um, where I, I discussed this. Uh, in uh, one of the famous uh, AI systems is a system, was a system that recognized cats on YouTube. That was a major achievement, it was, no denying. The machine can recognize cats on YouTube, yes. <clears throat> That's shallow thinking to me. Deep thinking is, for example, why are there so many cats on YouTube? The moment I tell you that there are so many cats on YouTube, the question is natural. Why are there so many cats on YouTube? And then you start thinking, uh, maybe you start thinking, uh, are cats typically involved in the cultural phenomena of the human race? You start thinking of all the mythical animals, you know, from unicorns to, uh, uh, to all the way to Mickey Mouse. And I actually can find a cat. And then you start thinking, okay, which, which was the first uh, uh, cat video on YouTube? I think one of, probably the, the, the very first uh, YouTube video probably was a cat video. Now I'm not sure. Either the first or the second. And then you start thinking, what about the cinema? You know, did cinema make uh, shorts about uh, cats? Okay, and I can go on. And then you start thinking of cats in, uh, I don't know, literature, science, Schrodinger's cat. Uh, the reader wrote about a uh, cat. That's deep thinking. That's what we do. We don't just recognize a cat on a, in a video. We do a lot of thinking around the cat. So I don't see machines helping me do that yet. Uh, if I spend 15 minutes with you at a cafe discussing cats, I see that happening. So there's still uh, there's still a uh, uh, big gap there. Okay, so you're saying, I guess, all your kind of disappointments in artificial intelligence right now, but what implementations of AI are really exciting you at this moment? I mean, there's a, there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot going on. <clears throat> there's a lot of interesting things. I, there's, I think, okay, I have, let me see if I share the screen again. Like, like this one. Yeah, this one. Can you see this? Yep, we can see it. Okay, this is AlphaGo, right? So this is uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, in this field, there's been a lot of progress and that is an exciting field. Now, <clears throat> I tell you from the beginning that I don't really know how they will make money of it, but certainly it's been impressive program because AlphaGo already uh, shocked because nobody expected to solve the, the game of Go so quickly. And then it became AlphaGo Zero, and then Alpha Zero, and then also reinforcement learning was used by OpenAI to do OpenAI Five, uh, that eventually played Dota, <clears throat> and uh, Google has used it to do AlphaFold uh, very recently. I don't know if you heard of it. This uh, this made uh, definitely it was a sensational news in uh, in biochemistry, and today we have technology like this. I don't want to get into details, but each one uh, has improved the performance of the system. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> the problem is that there's always too much hype. Every time one of these systems is announced, they say it matches or even surpasses human performance. Three months later, you have another one. Oops, the previous one didn't, but this one did. <clears throat> anyway, so 
Google is from Google as its own uh, family tree of systems, and they are evolving very rapidly and getting better and better. Um, so that, that's, uh, you see a line, average human, that J up there is agent uh, 57, <clears throat> which is one of the latest iterations. And Mu zero now is supposed to be even better. So how do you use the deep reinforcement learning? Well, that's a big question because so far it's been used mostly to play video games. But you know, there could be applications, there will be applications in robots. So that's exciting. Um, unfortunately, it requires a huge computational power. So that, again, that's one of those things that may be limited to uh, those who can afford the, the computational power. And then natural language processing, um, until two or three years ago, I was telling everybody that's the field where there's been very little progress. <clears throat> um, and then this uh, technology of attention came from England. Um, is also from then became self attention also in England, and the Google implemented it in 2017 in that transformer, and this transformer really changed the the field because uh, based on the transformer, in the last three years there's been one architecture after the other that allows for better and better language modeling. Now language modeling is not uh, <coughs> uh, is not new, but anyway language modeling. So, basically means being able to predict the next word in a sentence. Sounds like a typical statistical problem. Yes, it was done in st in st with statistics before. Now you do it with these networks that have many layers and they're much better at it. So if you show them enough text, typically taking them from the web, for example, from Wikipedia, they learn how to predict the probability that a word will be followed by a certain word. And that is important for everything, question answering, summarizing, translation, and so on. So all of these things have improved thanks to these uh, pre-trained models. And these were, yeah, this was 2019. Today, they're almost all old. Uh, Bert uh, from Google and GPT from OpenAI, very famous. Uh, NVIDIA introduced Megatron, Microsoft Turing NLG, 17 billion parameter language. To give you an idea, when I was a kid, you were lucky to have 20, 30 parameters, 17 billion. Think of a, of a parameter more or less as a neuron. And the GPT-3 made news uh, recently because again, it established a new <coughs> record <coughs> in a language generation and so on. This is, this is not performance, this is just complexity. Um, TNLG is the Microsoft Turing language model, 17 billion parameters. So here there's been a lot of progress. Of course, uh, it has to do with the uh, um, computational power. So a lot of it is just computational power. And that's, uh, so today that's the hype today that uh, every three, as I said, every three months, there's a new system that in theory beats uh, human performance beats humans at uh, natural language uh, uh, tasks. Why I say in theory? Because it's easy to prove that that is not true. Um, uh, I was just reading um, as a software engineer uh, did something sim simple with GPT-3 and his child. He had the GPT-3 and the child compete. Uh, he trained both the child and GPT-3 um, to generate uh, words with a P at the end. So instead of saying, I am Piero, I would say, I am Piero. And both, both succeeded. And then it, it tried to train both to generate, to add the P only to name of animals, and the child succeeded immediately. So cat P, uh, dog P, and so on, and GPT-3 failed. <clears throat> okay. Let's stop there. So that's exciting. And then common sense is the other thing I had on that slide that, that we're still far away from having machines that have common sense. That's, that's of course, uh, the mother of all problems. That's why you don't have a self-driving car in your, uh, in your garage. You know, so that's still the, the biggest, pro biggest unsolved problem is that deep learning just doesn't give you deep thinking and it doesn't give you common sense. So you know, some of us are skeptic that the current 
AI will ever solve the problem of common sense. Oops, I'm trying to stop share. Okay. And with that, we have a couple questions from the audience. One of them is, at the very beginning, your slide had China and US as some AI companies that had received funding. Are there any other countries, number th number three, number four, number five, or is there a huge gap there? Who, who oh, that's, actually, that's actually a good question because benevolent AI um, could be one of the most successful AI, AI companies and it's in England. Uh, that's actually a good question. Uh, the, the amount of investment doesn't necessarily tell you uh, who is doing well, who is not, but because they don't publish uh, uh, revenues, forget profits, then I, I cannot have a list of the most profitable companies, AI companies. But uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, England definitely, and, um, and then Germany for uh, Germany, Japan, Korea for robotics. <coughs> And also, where do you see a lot of the investment for AI going? What part of AI? There's so many, the AI umbrella is so broad. Is there a certain niche, certain sector that you're really seeing a lot of investments or money go towards? So again, if we talk about uh, pure AI startups, uh, startups that work on AI algorithms, uh, I really don't know <clears throat> because I honestly don't see the business plan. Uh, if we're talking about uh, investing companies that use AI to solve a problem, uh, then it's probably many. But I don't see, like, like a few years ago, everybody was thinking uh, chat, chat bots uh, would be big. And then, then, you know, that fizzled away. And, and then computer vision, yes, but that's been sold. Um, so, you know, now, now people think, uh, I don't know, uh, text generation. Uh, yes, but you know, open AI, um, GPT-3 pretty much solved the problem. So you can only have uh, uh, copycats and it's very difficult to compete with these guys because again, the computational power, the number of engineers. So, you know, and if you look at the, the list of the investment, I said, it looks like open AI got a lot of money but it got a lot of money from one investor. Uh, and, and, you know, some other companies got a lot of money from one investor, SoftBank. Um, so I don't know, I, 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 I expected that uh, there will be money for uh, hardware, uh, for chips that can run AI, especially, you know, you cannot take uh, Google's TPUs yet. You cannot take them and put them <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in, a, in a teeny device. Um, so that uh, <clears throat> I can see that there's a space there. So I'm not surprised that also in China there's been an investment in companies that make uh, chips for AI. Uh, but I really think we should, uh, in a sense, all this emphasis on AI is, is, uh, is misleading because we should start, we should keep thinking about the applications, which, which problem do you solve? And, and, then, and then that's probably a better way to try to figure out where the money goes, you know? So, so the, we just, this pandemic just explained to us how complicated it is to develop a vaccine. Uh, if you can AI, if you can use AI to make sure that vaccines will be developed in two days, oh my God, everybody will invest. Uh, so so let's let's focus on the on the problems and then it's, uh, it's more clear where it makes sense to invest. And with that, Piero, we're running out of time. We have to go to Sam Wong, who is our next presenter. But Piero, is there any last words you'd like to share with everyone? Happy New Year. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Piero, thank you again for your time tonight. And uh, everyone that's, that's listening, remember, we are recording this. A uh, link for the recording will be sent. Uh, and if you have any questions for our speakers tonight, please direct message me in the chat or uh, contact your host who will message me through WeChat. So Piero, thank you. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker for tonight, Sam Wong. Sam Wong has been a part of five companies. Uh, two of them have been massively successful, but I would like, Sam, could you give a brief intro 
of your career up to this point, and then we'll go right into the questions. Sure. Um, I basically started my career as an application developer in corporate IT. I did that for several years, and then I shifted into management and technical consulting. I uh, absolutely loved doing consulting. It was a wonderful place to be. You work with great people and do a lot of very interesting projects. I, I left consulting to do startups, which I found even more interesting, really. Um, it's just very, very dynamic space. So I've done five startup companies. Um, one of them, I was a CEO, once I was a CTO, and three times I was a technical VP. Um, of those five companies, the first two shut down, um, and it was unfortunate because they were very viable companies. You learn a lot when you see a company shut down. Um, the last three, thankfully, all had exits. Um, it's something that I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to be able to um, see the good and the bad, as well as the ugly, unfortunately. Um, after I left the company that, that acquired startup number five, I had some time. So I wrote a book on startup execution, um, 21 Secrets of Successful Startups. And now I run a company called Fundable Startups, where we do coaching, training, and tools to help founders build a fundable startup. Now, Sam, your, your company's called Fundable Startups, but aren't all startups that receive some type of funding, aren't they all fundable? Well, I guess you could say that it is, but I would actually uh, challenge that thought because to me, funding shouldn't be your goal. Uh, Founder-friendly funding should be the goal of fundraising and not all funding that's secured is founder-friendly. So when it comes to fundability, it's not just, well, did you get funding or not? That's not, you could have gotten you know, funding and not really have been fundable. When that happens, what that means is that there are other considerations that uh, you know really come into play. And I think the three considerations about fundability are valuation, terms, and investor quality. Okay. Found understands valuation. None of them are um, exactly binary either. They're all sliding scales. Okay. So valuation is where most rookie founders focus. They want to pitch to a potential investor and, and they negotiate. I think I'm worth a lot of money. I think I'm worth 10 million, 20 million, 100 million, whatever on the pre-money valuation. But there's lots of evidence that says the valuation is actually not the most important consideration for what matters to most founders. And what matters to most founders are the economics, how much money you'll make on the pay when the company exits and the control of the company, okay? Valuation oftentimes doesn't have the most impact on those two factors. The smart and experienced veteran founders know that terms, the second aspect, the second uh, consideration of fundability can oftentimes be more important. Um, in a typical Series A preferred stock fundraising, uh, you know, um, term sheet, a financing term sheet, there are about two dozen different sets of terms. Of that two dozen, maybe half can have a significant impact on your payout, your level of control. So you have to kind of really look very, very carefully at what those terms are. Valuation is just one of the, the considerations. And then finally, the third factor about, to me, uh, that... Um, shows how fundable you really are, is the quality of the investor who chooses to invest. It's been said before that uh, when you uh, take an investment from an investor, you are getting married to that investor because oftentimes you'll have a relationship with that investor that's five, seven, 10 years long, and maybe even beyond the life of that one particular startup. It's funny because when you look at investor quality, I like to use an analogy. 73% of American drivers think their driving skills are above average, which makes no sense. That can't be correct. Okay. It should be 50% or their skills are above average. And of course, 50% are below average. But if you ask, um, most people, especially men, will say, well, I'm, my, my skills are above average. 73% of uh, American drivers think that. Let's take that analogy and apply it to investors. There is a concept out there in the investment community about uh, called dumb money. Basically, you could have gotten money from a poor quality investor, and that investor maybe doesn't really do that much to help you. Maybe that person was wealthy 
and that person gave you money, but they're not really helping you, so that's considered dumb money. I bet if you went and surveyed investors, just about 95% or more will probably say, I don't give dumb money. I'm smart money. Okay, so that's probably not true in, in, in all cases, just like the driving situation. There's also, when you look at investor quality, there's also the concept of bad money. Okay, in just as there are, you know, investors are investments are made by human beings, just as there are uh, people who you enjoy being a friend with or enjoy spending time with, there are going to be people you don't enjoy spending time with. When you're married to your investor and they always are hard, they have unreasonable expectations, they are difficult, they flip-flop, they are constantly critical and, and such. That's probably an example of taking bad money. So you know, there's, there's a, a, a very good uh, coach out there to, who I follow, a guy named um, Brett Fox. He's a former CEO uh, and such. He actually divides the investor community into three groups. 20% really great investors, 60% good to mediocre, and then 20% really bad investors. And that's a large percentage. One fifth of the investor community are people you probably don't want to take money from, even if they're willing. So when you look at valuation terms and investor quality, that's all part of consideration, which um, I think affects your fundability. So you had mentioned a lot about funding terms there. Can you give us some examples of what founder-friendly versus investor-friendly terms would be? Sure. Um, and, and terms are very, very important. Like I said, there's about two dozen or so terms on the typical Series A preferred stock fundraising. Okay. Um, the, probably the most common that has the, one of the most, the largest impact on founder payout is going to be liquidation preference. So there are two aspects of liquidation preference, the preference multiple and the participation rights. Preference, liquidation preference ultimately is if you give an investor that right, that investor has the right to take money out of a sale first. In other words, the investors eat first. What's left over gets shared amongst the founders and employees. Okay. So the first aspect of liquidation preference is going to be the preference multiple. And that's where if I'm an investor and I put in $10 million into um, a certain startup, when that company, if I have a 2X liquidation preference multiple, then when that company gets acquired, let's say for 100 million, all right? Because I put in 10 million, I have a 2X preference. I get to take the first 1 million out, okay? So what gets left over is the 80 million for everybody else to share, but I get the first 20 million. Then the second component of liquidation preference is participation rights. So I may have no participation, capped participation, or full participation. Let's say I have full particip participation rights. That means not only do I get the first 20 million, I also take my preferred stock equity percentage and take a percentage. So let's say I own 25% of the company. So I get another 25% of the 80 million. So I walk out of there with, eh, what, $40 million when I only own 25% of the equity? That's because liquidation preference gave me the ability to, you know, if in this case, double dip in my payout. Obviously, liquidation preference has a big impact on what is left over for the founders and the employees. There's another term which doesn't get a whole lot of attention. It's drag along rights. And I use this as an example because uh, what drag along rights is, is if an investor has that right, they have the ability to make a decision and force everybody else to comply. So I wish I could do that with my kids. <laughs> um, but basically someone with drag along rights can say, we're going to go in this direction or we're going to accept this acquisition offer and you can't do anything about it. I can force you to come along. This right combined with liquidation preference, uh, became very prominent in the case of a company called FanDuel. So FanDuel is a sports betting you know, type of you know, uh, gaming company, okay? And they were acquired by another betting company. Uh, I wouldn't say, um, they, they were acquired by um, another gaming company and it was a, the acquisition was huge. It was $465 million. The founders in that situation 
even though they sold the company for half a billion dollars, the founders walked away with nothing because they had very poor liquidation preference and the investor had a drag along, right? So the investor said, this acquisition is good for me. Sorry, you lose. All right. And then of course the founders sued and, but you know, they couldn't get anywhere because they signed the contract. They signed the term sheet that gave all these rights to the investors. It was their own fault because they didn't have a very fundable company they thought they won when they got deals when they when they secured the funding but when the time came for exit they walked away with nothing from the acquisition so that's a very clear example of of some, some of the challenges i'd say one other uh, thing that can be a a hidden surprise for lots of founders is the pro rata rights and pro rata rights are what allows an earlier investor to maintain their portion of ownership on the cap table. Okay, let's say I'm an early investor and um, let's say I'm Y Combinator, Y Combinator does this. If you take the Y Combinator deal, they invest $125,000 and you pay Y Combinator 7% of your company's equity with pro rata rights. In the Past, they used to uh, that seven percent meaning that the next time someone invested, the next time you got fund funds, Y Combinator was allowed to maintain the seven percent by buying more uh, of equity alongside the incoming investor. Why does that matter? Sometimes the incoming investor says, "I'm a big cheese investor." I'm with XYZ uh, uh, Venture Capital Fund and I wanna be in control. My control states that I want 25% of the company for this amount of money I'm investing. Well, you do the math on it. If Y Combinator or whoever the investor is has a pro rata right, they might say, excuse me, you might want 25%, but that I can keep my 7%. So yes, Y Combinator has to put more money in to stay at 7% and not get diluted. But then there's a problem. What if the founders didn't want to sell that much stock? They only wanted to sell 25%. They didn't want to sell 30% or, you know, uh, that's not the exact math, but I'm keeping it simple, okay? Then you gave the right to Y Combinator. You can't stop them. And if, the, if you don't want to sell that much and the investor says, I want my 25% or I'm not buying, then what will happen is that you have to go to the investor with pro rata rights and said, can you please, pretty please, don't exercise your right. Can you please, pretty please, waive that right? And if the, inv the investor who holds pro rata rights says, no, you gave it to me, you're a successful company, I want to keep my 7%. And then the, what ends up happening is that you have to stand off. Any investor says, I want 25%. Existing founders say, I don't want to sell more than 25%. And the, the investor with the pro rata rights, I want my 10%. And what ends up happening is that the uh, uh, Y Combinator, whoever, who has the pro rata right, can actually block the incoming investor from coming in. Because they said, well, I'm not going to give up my pro rata rights. And then the incoming investor says, if you're not going to sell. So effectively, someone with pro rata rights can stop an investment from coming in. Those are things that don't really play out in the minds of the average founder because they haven't gone through enough of these scenarios. They don't understand how these terms can either hurt their um, payout or they don't understand how these terms can, um, can block uh, a potential new investment. Even if Y Combinator or whoever holds the pro rata right says, okay, fine, I'm not gonna exercise my pro rata right. The unintended consequence of that is the incoming investor says, why don't they want to exercise it? If this company is successful, doesn't the existing investor want to keep putting in more money to keep their equity at percentage at a certain level? What's wrong with the company? And there's an unintended signaling effect where the incoming investor suddenly is wondering, is there something wrong with that house? Do I really want to buy that house? Do I really want to buy the stock? So 
these are all just small examples of you know, the two dozen different uh, types of investor terms that a founder might end up unintentionally giving away or un giving away unaware of the downstream impact two, three, or five years down the road. When talking about pro rata rights, you'd mentioned cap tables. Can you go into more detail and quickly define what that is and, and give us a little bit more information on that? Sure, sure. It's uh, cap table is short for capitalization table, and it's the authoritative ledger that says who owns what portion of the company's stock. It's actually a very complex um, instrument. Of, it's some people try to track it on a spreadsheet. After a little while, tracking on spreadsheets just starts to fall apart. That's why there's companies like Carta and CapShares and a bunch of other companies that manage a cap table for you. Basically, the people on the cap table will be typically your founders, the investors, the advisors, the employees of the company through the stock option program. The reason the cap table is significant, besides the fact that it says who owns what, the cap table actually tattles on you. It's like having a kid who just says, mommy and daddy had a fight last night. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. How does that happen? Well, a seasoned investor can look at the cap table and they might see a couple of problems. One potential problem is an unbalanced cap table, unbalanced equity, where you might have one uh, uh, founder who has a lot of equity compared to founder number two. I saw this problem in a startup that I, I was working with where the CEO had 26% of the equity and Dito, who was also a founder, had 1%. Okay, that was very unbalanced. What ended up happening was when that company ran into some problems, roadblocks, bumps in the road, which always happens, that CTO basically said, why am I here? It's not worth the pain and the trouble. And that CTO quit. That CTO was a very important person for the company. Okay. So unbalanced equity can be exposed on the capital. Another might be fragmented equity. You're only a one-year-old company. How come there's uh, 40 people on your cap table? What in the world did you, well, I raised $500 from, you know, 35 people or whatever. Now everybody is you're gonna have a say. The reason having a fragmented cap table is a problem is that in some corporate um, actions, you have to get sign off from everybody who owns a piece of the company. How do you get 35 people to agree to go in the same direction? Very hard to do. Another problem that the cap table will expose will be debt equity. Um, how come there's this guy who owns 7% of the uh, company but he's not on your employee roster. Oh, that was a founder that we had a while back and he ended up not being a very good fit. And well, why does he still have 7%? Oh, because we didn't put vesting on his founder shares and he got all the shares, blah, blah, blah. Oh, now I'm an investor. So I say, okay, 7%, are, that's, that's your problem. But what that shows, you are a dumb founder. Okay, you didn't put vesting on that and such. Now I don't think that highly of you. Now, even if I invest in the these problems that come up with the cap table can basically expose your dirty laundry. And those are things that founders don't do a good enough job to manage, and they don't realize what happens when they they go down the road further with their startup. So Sam, I, I got a question. Drag along rights and pro rata rights, are they the mm -hmm. same thing or something different? They're def definitely different. Uh, as I mentioned, drag along rights are the ability for uh, the person with the right to say, you, you are going this way. If I have a group of friends and I want to see a movie, if I have drag along rights, I get to choose the movie. I don't care if you don't want to see that movie or if you've seen it again, you're going with me. Pro rata rights is... I own 7% of the company. The next time you get investment, normally I would be diluted down maybe to 5%, 4% or whatever the math works out to be. Pro rata right would allow me to say, well, I can stay at 7% if I also put in the pro rata or the proportional amount of money as a new investor coming in so I can stay at my 7%. They're very different. And another question was asked, tag along rights, what's that? Um, I actually meant tag along. Oh, I made tag oh sorry. Okay. Yeah, I meant I it was my okay, problem. problem. No problem. Are, are they the same thing? Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, so brag along versus tag along. Right. Brag along is uh, the you know decision maker. I get to decide. Tag along is someone else decides. Get to go with you. For example, um, the tag along right might be, um, let's say um, there's a founder who does a private stock sale. It's written, all right. <laughs> Um, I'm a, let's say I'm a founder and I own 10% of the company. And let's say I just want to sell a little bit of the stock. I want to sell 1% of my 10%, leaving me with nine to some friend I know who's going to buy it. If I'm an investor and I have tag along rights to say, Hmm, I need to take some money out of the company. Uh, so that guy who's selling 1%, I get to tag along on the sale. What does that mean? You can't force the buyer to buy more than 1%. What it means is that if I have a tag along right, then some proportion, depending on the terms of the right, some proportion of that founder who wanted to sell 1%, he ends up, let's say, three, three quarters, and the investor sells one quarter percent. He gets to tag along on the deal. So it, it's interesting. Uh, it's a nice right to be able to have, uh, but they're definitely different than drag along and tag along. All right, and for everyone out there, please remember, uh, keep your microphones on mute. If you have a question, direct message me. I will ask our presenters today. So Sam, with that, how can a more tech-savvy founder that may not know the sophistications of a negotiation, how can they learn this? how to become sophisticated negotiations? What, what should they learn for that so they're not taking advantage? Wow. So there's a lot... There's lots of ways to be able to learn. Um, fundamentally, I think the learning is important to know, okay, th these terms, but it just takes time to be able to learn. You kind of, it helps to be able to have either a good attorney or even better, a good startup coach, all right? What I would say that's more effective than just being informed about what all these things can happen, because there's dozens and dozens of different scenarios that could pop up, okay? What's more important than maybe just work I learn all these things so I make sure I get you know I don't get taken advantage of the most important thing is build a fundable startup if you build a high quality healthy growing strong fundable startup you as the founder are in the driver's seat you at that point have lots of investors who want to invest in you and you get to pay if this investor is giving you bad terms then you'll go with this other investor who gives other who gives better terms that's the part, what I would say is more important than just learning. Make sure you build a fundable startup. And then Sam, you keep talking about, you know, a, a founder friendly, fundable startup. How does a founder go about finding founder friendly investors? Um, well, it's, it, there is a process of finding founder fun, friendly investors in the same way that you want to, um, interview basically your employee base and such you don't just hire the first resume who applies for a job you go through some type of interview process and you're selective okay unfortunately most founders are so desperate for funding they don't do that with their investors the reality is investors don't many of them don't expect you to do that and they don't really give you the the avenue to do that because they are in control you are the beggar they are the giver okay well, if you build a fundable startup, something that multiple investors are competing in, then they actually have to, they're, they're not as much in control of the negotiation process. You are on better footing, okay? It's hard to get to equal footing, all right? It's even harder to get to better footing than the, uh, the, than the investor. But the reality is build a healthy company, Okay, which means lots of different things. And we can talk about that in a moment. Um, but build a healthy company that people want to invest in. And then you have more ability to influence the terms, the, uh, the conditions, and the amount of the fundraise. And then Sam, we got a few minutes left. What are you working on? Yeah. So um, I'm working on a lot of stuff to help people build a fundable startup. <laughs> okay. Uh, and it's, how do you, how do you build a fundable startup? Well, there's a lots of different things. You, you have to focus on strategy first, tactics second. Okay. Don't worry about the pitch deck. Of course that needs to be done, but 
the strategy is, you know, um, is more important. So focused, uh, my, my focus right now is helping companies to build uh, a strategic uh, way to be able to grow their company. I also focus on helping people build a strong team, which I think is one of the most neglected aspects of building a startup. Everybody says they want good people. I haven't seen a single startup that actually invests in, in infrastructure and framework that does it. Talent matters, but most people just give talent a lip service alone. Okay, so lots of different things that that uh, uh, need to help a startup build a strong talent strategy. So that's one of the classes. Funding strategy is another class I, I, I've launched, and I've also done a lot of content based on uh, execution. Execution is about doing lots of things well. You can't just say, go and you know, execute well. That's, no, it, to execute well, you have to break down the components of the company into the smaller pieces, and then each one of them individually, you have to execute well. So you need a lot of uh, business acumen technical expertise, a lot of just seasoned experience to be able to execute well. I'm building, like I said, a lot of content, a lot of online training. I've got four courses right now with a fifth one coming soon. Uh, all of these courses, which was I try to really um, do is they come with ready to use color by numbers templates as well. I, and I also just did a, a soft launch of a YouTube channel, which in, in 2021 will actually emphasize be push, pushing a lot more content out there. So I'm doing a lot of con courseware development right now. Sam, if you could add any of those links to either the chat or send them to us and we can send them to everyone here, that'd be fantastic. And with that, there's time for, I think, one more question, possibly two. Uh, question, idea, execution, or team? What's the most important thing for starting your company? Uh, in my opinion, it is execution, which is driven by the team. Um, there was a, a, a famous TED talk in the startup space done by Bill Gross. He's the chairman of Idea Labs, generally considered the very first accelerator, okay, startup incubator accelerator out there. And he uh, did a survey of 200 startups and he f looked to see what was the single most important thing to make the startup successful. And the number one consideration actually that made a startup successful was actually timing. Okay, did you launch at the right time? Well, that's kind of hard because Sam, I think I lost you there for, for a moment. My Wi-Fi just cut out. My apologies. But uh, with that, I mean, it's about time for our next speaker, Matthew Lewis. So, so Sam, I want to thank you again for your time today. And please put any of your information in the chat area. And if anyone wants to reach out to Sam directly, either contact me or look up Sam on, on LinkedIn. Uh, I mean, he's helped a countless number of startups here, and he's a great resource for everyone. So, Sam, once again, thank you. And with that, Matthew, are you ready to begin? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Hey, thanks, Sam. I really enjoyed that presentation. That was good. Um, you know, I work with individuals, so I would love to see some individual faces on the screen. <laughs> Somebody um, join us? I just got a bunch of static pictures. Yeah, we, we got quite a few in, in Korea and China on TechBook and our other platforms that we're live streaming it to. And I guess you're getting everyone's face as well. Oh, so, nice. uh, and I opened it up. So okay, now excellent. you can share your screen uh, for any slides or anything in your okay. presentation. So. Be good. Okay, hold on. Let me figure out how to do this. Yeah, I think that's the one. Can you see that? Hello, Sean. You're Hello. good to go. Yes, we can see your. Okay. Hello, Sean. You there? Um, okay. and just tell me, um, are the slides moving right now? In full screen mode. Okay, good. All right. So I get this little disclaimer because I am in the investment world. <laughs> I don't expect you to read every word in this disclaimer. Not offering investment 
advice here or tax advice. It's just high level educational. So um, a little bit about me. Uh, I have a management firm work primarily with entrepreneurs, and I would say half of them are international. Um, I also teach enterprise risk management at UC Berkeley Extension. And uh, I've, got, I've got a little podcast, but uh, it really pales in comparison to Sean's. Um, and then more recently, I started something called Room to Run. If there are any runners out there, uh, please check this out. It's a lot of fun. It, it's a way to um, share a running experience that's pandemic proof. All right, well, let's, let's get on with this. So I have, I'm gonna start with this one. I've got eight dates that I see entrepreneurs making a lot in Silicon Valley. And because a lot of you, uh, many of you are abroad, I thought I'd begin with the last one. So um, I've seen some entrepreneurs set up C-Corps and do everything the right way. And then they become US tax residents too early because they haven't thought it through. They haven't, um, they, they may be unaware of US taxation. It uh, being very unique in that the US is, I think, one of three countries in the world that taxes your entire worldwide income. And it gets worse than that, actually, because if you have assets abroad and you have not um, uh, engaged in any tax planning, when you sell those assets, if they have a low basis, you could end up paying a huge tax bill to the US government. Arrest, and though you've been a tax resident for you know, a small amount of time. Okay, so that's number eight. We're going to return to that one at the end of the presentation and have a different take on it. Uh, one last thing. So if you make mistakes, if you uh, don't have any tax planning before you become a U.S. tax resident, usually the temptation, especially people from different cultures, like let's say Russia or India, I used to live in Russia, so I can speak to that, <laughs> is, to, is to hide the information. And that's very dangerous because we have uh, very stringent disclosure requirements and kind of carrying more and more information. And uh, it would be awful to have to pay penalties. So it, it's, it's good to come clean. And it's uh, a great idea to engage in some tax planning before you become a US tax resident. All right. So. Uh, one of the first things you can do as a founder, if, when you're starting a company, you can look to uh, a, a tax election called an 83B. It's an election to pay taxes early. Now, why in heaven would you ever do that? <laughs> well, in this case, uh, in, you can pay a higher tax rate early on restricted stock. So you're not required to pay the taxes, but you elect to. And you do that because uh, the, the gain on which you are being taxed is very low. In fact, it may be zero dollars. So if you had a high tax rate, uh, 30, 40% on zero, well, that equals zero. And that's a pretty good deal. And, uh, and then, so th this applies to restricted stock, say stock that's vesting, and venture capitalists will insist that your stock vests in, in your, startup so you don't have that dead equity that we heard about from Sam just now. Um, the 83B will solve a problem for you down the line when your shares are vesting. Let's say your, your company is doing better and better and the valuation is going up. Well, those are paper profits and the IRS will want to tax you on those as the shares vest, but you may not have any cash. So every time these shares vest, you have this problem over and over with liquidity. And if you took an 83B, you could avoid this. And that's what that bullet says, right? Okay, yeah, and um, this, this last bullet is kind of interesting. So what if you're not a US tax resident when, it, when you have the choice to file an 83B? Well, it, it may behoove you to figure out a way to take it to just even though you're not required to because you're not a US tax resident yet. If, if you think you will become a US tax resident down the line in a year or two when your shares are still vesting, well, it would be great to take the 83B now. And you can do that with the assistance of, of a lawyer. Okay, 
moving on to number two. Um, I see a lot of entrepreneurs overvaluing um, an equity stake when they're joining a startup. And uh, building on Sam's point again, that has to do usually with uh, liquidation preferences. So the first thing you want to know is whether the firm is going to share information and be, be open with you about their funding situation and how it evolves over time. And you need to get uh, an idea of how much the firm is worth. And you need to watch out for these liquidation preferences and understand them because your equity stake may be worth absolutely nothing. So your chore is to figure out at what firm value does your stake start to be worth more zero. And then you'll be in a better position to make a decision whether you join that particular team. Okay, um, restricted stock units. This seems really basic. People make mistakes with RSUs. Often they think they receive their restricted stock units that they need to hold on to them in order to qualify for long-term tax treatment. And that is true, but when you receive, when, when RSUs vest and you receive the shares in a company you work for, you immediately get taxed on them. And then if you were immediately to sell them, well, the price hasn't moved much, let's say, over a day or two, it's probably the same exact price and your taxes are zero, right? So you could you could sell the shares and then decide which company stock you wanna buy, any company. You know, and then the same long-term tax treatment rules would apply. But for some reason, people think, say they work for Facebook and they receive stock when an RSU vest, they think they have to hold on to it for a year. No, that, that's not the case. Um, another problem is that, especially among people who have received incentive stock options, they're, they're used to the concept of having paid for the shares, right? And with an RSU, you receive shares as compensation and they're immediately taxed. Hey, hey Matthew, not sorry to cut you off, but uh, yeah. we're getting comments that it's a static page. We're not seeing your next slide. Is there oh, a way well, you can Oh, thank you very much. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. You can see this, right? Yeah, we saw the next slide. And yeah. uh, thank good. you from the audience for pointing that out. Okay, yeah, but please um, notify me the next time if you don't see the, when I move to number four, please tell me. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so sometimes people actually end up paying taxes twice because on their brokerage statement, say from a Schwab, it shows that base is zero. Well, their, their basis is not zero. It's just that Schwab doesn't have a record of it. And you, you could erroneously instruct your accountant to pay taxes on those shares and you've already paid taxes. Your employer already took it from you. So that, that would be the absolute worst nightmare scenario. In, incentive stock options. Did, did you see the slide move? Are we on number four? Nope, you're static again. Oh my God, okay. I don't know what to do here. Okay, you see this, right? Okay, I'll just go in and out every time. Sounds good. Okay. And guys, remember, he is a professor at UC Berkeley extensions. All right, come on. <laughs> Actually works on UC Berkeley Zoom for some reason. I don't know why, but anyway. Okay, so incentive stock options, they are complex because of something called the AMT. And I won't go into that, but just suffice it to say that they're complex. And because of that, uh, a lot of people end up doing nothing. They don't exercise their incentive stock options. They just let them pile up. And that's really dangerous because you end up with a concentrated position that's more risk. And then on top of it, there is a, a limit on how many ISOs you can exercise in a year, $100,000. Now, if you let the ISOs pile up and the company's doing well, then you won't be able to get that money out at a good tax rate because you'll be limited to just a hundred thousand per year. Yep. Oh, and then this can lead you to the next problem. If you don't have uh, enough cash to, to exercise, to pay the taxes and to, to exercise your ISOs, um, 
you can become a hostage to your company. You just stay there. Or if you do decide to leave, you'll have uh, about 60 days to pay for your vested shares that you haven't, the ISOs you haven't exercised yet. And so you, you either stand to, you know, it, it's, it's a pretty awful decision. You stay with a company you're not happy with, but you want because you want to hold on to the shares, or you leave and you don't have enough cash to hold on to your vested shares. So you should really have a plan ahead of time for ISOs. Okay, I'm going to back out and go back in. Okay, let's see here. Now, if you're an angel investor uh, and you are a U.S. tax resident, a Roth IRA is a very nice thing. Um, so with a Roth, the money that um, is contributed to that vehicle has already been taxed. So as soon as it goes in, it's never taxed again. Uh, the, the appreciation of the shares is a tax, nor are the withdrawals. Okay. And because those contributions are made after tax, you can pull them out at any time. So you have a lot more flexibility and uh, much more liquidity. And a, a lot of people think that you're limited to just uh, $6,000, $7,000 a year in contributions. There are other ways around that limitation to contribute money to a Roth. And in order to buy shares in startups, uh, which you think will do very well, uh, you need to choose a custodian that will allow you to do this. So a, a Schwab or a Morgan Stanley uh, will limit you to publicly traded companies uh, and, and so stocks and bonds. But there are custodians uh, who will allow you to by private shares and alternative investments. You just have to choose the right one. Okay. And let's see, where are we? There's also something known as the uh, qualified small business stock. Now for startups, this can be really important because you can avoid paying a gain on the first, sorry, you can avoid paying taxes on the first $10 million of gain or even 10 times your basis. So if you invested, let's say $5 million, then $50 million of gain avoid tax. Now there obviously are some requirements of this. The main ones, the high level ones are that you do this through a C-Corp. The company is a C-Corp, not an LLC. You hold on to the shares for five years and you receive the shares directly. Um, when the shares are issued the first time. Okay. And then this is just, uh, I, I, you, you see entrepreneurs uh, with the mentality of all or nothing. And unfortunately they take it to an extreme and they have no retirement savings and they're unable to take care of their families. Uh, one obvious way to build a retirement savings is if you work for a tech company and there's uh, and, and the employer uh, match your contribution, well, you should definitely take it. That's, that's free money. But if you're a founder, there are ways to uh, build retirement savings as well. There are tax deferred vehicles like solo 401ks. And a lot of founders are just so busy, they don't know about these vehicles. Okay, now we're returning to number eight again, but I'm looking at it from a different So, uh, if you are not a US tax resident, you're actually in a pretty good situation with regard to US tax taxes because um, if a non-resident buys shares, uh, say in the stock market here, uh, the tax on capital gain is zero, believe it or not, and the tax on interest income is zero. On dividends, it will, it will depend on the tax treaty between your country and the United States. And um, strange as it may seem, you know, the US has chased its citizens around the world and forced foreign institutions to tattle on them uh, and, and provide more transparency. But then the rest of the world decided 
you know, if the U.S. is going to force us to do all this, this disclosure and monitoring, well, we should monitor our citizens. So they, all those other countries got the OECD sharing information. Now, but the funny thing is that the U.S. doesn't share much information with them. So there's some kind of strange carve out because the U.S. is powerful and the first country to do this. So the information doesn't really flow from the U.S. to these other countries. And that has, strangely enough, that, that means that the United States is basically the new Switzerland. So, um, so yeah, before becoming a U.S. tax resident, you might want to weigh all of these issues carefully. Uh, and this is just, do we have any runners among us in the audience there? Matt, are you on slide six? Because you've been on slide six this whole time. Oh, my God. I thought you were going to give me a heads up. <laughs> okay. So here, here we are with the retirement savings. Okay. No retirement savings. And uh, yeah, this must be a keynote. Okay. This is about coming the next Switzerland. Right. Um, and, and even confidentiality is, is built into our system. <clears throat> and then, um, do we have any runners in the audience? I can't see anybody. Is anybody raising their Yes. Hand? Okay, excellent. Yeah, um, so some of us have become more fit during the pandemic. Others have gone in the other direction. Uh, if you enjoy running in a group and you can't because of the pandemic, uh, I've, I've started something that's a lot of fun uh, we, we get together on Clubhouse, and I've got a Facebook group if you want to get that, that code with your phone. It's a page, and I'm trying to fill out this map. So if you happen to be abroad, I mean, you don't have to, if you're in the United States, I'd love to see you too. But um, I'd love to be able to fill out this map with posts and photos of, of runners around the world. And if you could help me do that, that would be great. Okay, uh, let's see. Resume, share. Where am I? I think I can't seem to get out of here. There we go. Okay, well, that's that's it. And here's a uh, another code if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. All right, Matt, now uh, time for questions. The first one that we got might be a little bit of a doozy for you. If, uh, if, if you can answer it, great. If not, we'll go on to the next one. Yeah. If your U.S. Corp sets up a Chinese subsidiary <laughs> with a percentage of the C subsidiary being sold for B UN, how does the PL roll up mean for the corporate taxes? Yes, I'm, a, I'm going to have to hear the question again. And if the person asking the question could leave in some uh, email or some way to get back to them, that would be great. Okay. But let's hear the question one more time. I didn't quite get it the first time. If your US corporation, sets yeah. up a Chinese subsidiary with a percentage of the Chinese subsidiary being sold for renminbi yuan. How does the P&L roll up mean for the corporate taxes? How does the P&L roll up? I don't, I'm not understanding those last couple of words, but, but send it to me in written form and we'll work on it. Okay. All right, next question. Matthew, do you take founders outside of the U.S. as clients for financial advisory services? Yep. yep. In fact, um, I used to live abroad over a decade. And so um, I know what it's like uh, being between countries and jurisdictions and tax codes. And uh, yeah, and I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that I'd say over half of my clients are actually foreign. Matthew, what are some of the biggest problems you see that overseas companies face when coming to the U.S. with transferring funds or setting up accounts? Well, it depends on which country they're coming from. But, um, you know, I would say I, I used to do a lot of cross-border deals. Uh, I was based in Moscow, and I would... Uh, attract capital from the United States, the UK, Canada, Europe, Israel. And 
You know, it's funny, but the cultural differences are really important. I've seen so many deals scuttled for the most ridiculous reasons. And it's often it's just the wrong word or the something said in the wrong context or something was misunderstood. And once you undermine trust, it's really hard to, to get it back. So I would, I would say the cultural differences are the most important. What about investors' appetites for deals? Um, do you see different countries negotiating uh, differently? And with that, I, we'll have time for one more question after, and uh, then we'll move to our, our, our next speaker. So, uh, Matthew, do you have an opinion on that? Could you rephrase the question? I'm not sure I got it. Uh, investors from other countries, the appetites for investing, uh, what are you yeah, seeing? It- well, it, it, it depends on where they're from. So um, I find that from Eastern Europe, uh, people tend to like tangible things. They tend to like control. They like real estate. Um, if they like startups, they're usually in something you know, very hot and fashionable. Um, I think uh, my Indian friends and clients seem to be more interested in software as a service. Uh, those, those types of investments. And, and you could probably speak to that, answering that question, Sean. Hey, you know, Matthew, yeah. you're the expert. And with that, <laughs> uh, th- this is a two-part question. And remember everyone, please direct message me myself. Please don't put the questions for, for everyone. But next question, um, Matthew, do you have any advice for US-based startups when they hire their first employees outside of the US? What are some things these startups should do? When should they form a corporation in the other countries? Mm. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I guess you have to decide what the threshold is, uh, what, what amount of investment in time and resources will trigger this move from just having outsourced employees to having you know, control over a subsidiary that will be reflected on your books and that investors will see. And it's, it's, it's also important the, um, to know how your investors view this issue. Do they want everything institutional from day one or are they happy to have uh, you know, a kind of employee light uh, firm with a lot of outsourcing? And I, I think in many cases, the question will come down to the IP risks and, and whether they're addressed sufficiently um, with these employees or contractors uh, out, outside of the United States. Oh, and, and Matthew, I guess to piggyback on that right there, are there any yeah. issues with paying these non-US employees of a US company? Well, I mean, it depends on which country. Sure, there can be capital controls, there can be difficulties with banks. Um, I'm not sure I understand the nature of the question, but uh, there are more and more options to to pay people. Transfer-wise, it's very convenient in Europe. Um, I'm not sure what the penetration is in Asia. but All right. And with that, Matthew, thank you for your time today. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with everyone out there. Could you, if you, if you're okay with it, put your contact information in the chat uh, or any information for people to get in contact with you if they'd like to follow up or, or um, I guess we can share your QR code with everyone as well. So please scan the QR code. We'll leave that up for a moment. And Paul, when you're ready, could we see your, your lovely face, turn on the camera and let's, let's begin. Okay. Here I am. And, and with that, Paul, can you give a brief introduction of your career up to this point before we begin with the q and I'll make it very brief because it's got a lot of twists and turns. First of all, thanks for having me, Sean. I always appreciate the opportunity to address a new crowd and welcome to everybody tonight. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, I have a background in risk assessment and IP. IP is probably my biggest strength. I've done a lot of different jobs in a lot of different technology areas and industries. It gives me a very broad base of experience that allows me to address problems, which is very handy. Uh, I used to be the general manager of a co-working space in San Francisco called The Vault. 
And while at the vault, not only did I meet startups from all around the world, but I met several Korean, many Korean companies. We ran two accelerators with, from Korea. So it was really interesting, learned a lot. And I feel like I've seen pretty much everything there is to see in the startup world. So. So wait, Paul, with that, I mean, you just mentioned that you've come across many international startups and many from Korea. What are some of the problems that that a lot of the Korean companies seem to face when coming to Silicon Valley? Well, I think not just from Korea, but from all over the world, people have a vision of how things work here that they may have read about or heard stories about or watched a movie or a TV show that doesn't reflect the reality. So I think anybody who wants to come here needs to figure out what's the real reason for coming? How do things work with what they're trying to do? Are they trying to raise money? Are they trying to set up a new company here? Are they trying to hire people, expand into new markets? So I think the problem is a lack of awareness of how things really work on the ground in, in, in the San Francisco, Silicon Valley area. But of course that applies in any market anywhere. The biggest issue is that around here, there's so much going on that it's really hard to get noticed if you're trying to get noticed. And so you really gotta be aware of what's going on in your space and how you can differentiate yourself. Otherwise, it might be a fairly futile time experience coming here. Well, I guess then, how should a company prepare in anticipation of coming to Silicon Valley? Well, that's probably a longer answer than we have time for tonight. The basics are, you have to have a really solid foundation at home, wherever you're coming from. You've gotta have the support and the resources to take a risk of coming here You've got to be able to define success as it applies to your company. You've got to understand how much time and money you're willing to sink into it. I mean, are you going to give it three months? Are you going to give it two years? You need to figure these things out. You need to understand the dynamics of the marketplace you're going after so that you can make a proper estimate of what it's going to take. I mean, you'd hate to underestimate or overestimate too much. You'd hate to come here and get 90% of the way there and then all just say, well, it's not working. Let's go. Let's get out of here. I think the the hardest problem is collecting enough information to make smart enough decisions about uh, an expansion into the US. Again, whether to raise money, to set up a business here, to just try to access the markets, form partnerships. There's a lot of different reasons to come here. So make sure you know what your reasons are and make sure you understand the resources and the risks uh, that are involved in doing such a thing. Basically, you can never know too much about a new market when you're trying to go there. So the more you know, the better you'll be. So, hey, Paul, what are some of the resources that a company could connect with when coming here? Well, for example, tonight, I understand you've got a pretty stellar roster of speakers and, re and experience uh, for the group tonight. So that's a place to start. Uh, let's, let's not forget that doing business is still in many ways a contact sport. It's not all databases and, and, and digital trickery. A lot of it is knowing people, getting referrals. Um, having a network that can connect you with the right people for what you're trying to do. And coming from a place like Korea, there are, of course, dedicated Korean resources here in the area. Uh, of course, all the big corporations are here. Samsung has a large research and commercial presence here, of course. Um, I, there's lots of organizations that specialize in training companies how to come here. I work with U.S. Market Access, to name one. I know they've worked with Korean groups a lot. There's uh, chamber of commerce like functions that they could tap into again you really need to reach out and get a diversity of viewpoints about what goes on in the market segment you're trying to address so i would say linkedin is also a good resource linkedin can be kind of confusing to navigate but if you have if you learn how to find the resources you need a place like linkedin can be very valuable and i would say most importantly don't be afraid to just reach out just like the equivalent of a cold call a cold email to somebody saying we're a company, we do this, we're looking for information on that, would you be willing to help us out? I get those requests on a regular basis. Sometimes I say yes, sometimes I say no, but you're not gonna get an answer to an email that you don't send. So I think that don't be afraid to be bold. Maybe that's one of the best lessons to learn about coming to California. Don't be afraid to be bold. The worst somebody can say is leave me alone. And with that, I want to remind everyone in the audience, uh, please direct message me any of your questions or direct message your contact person at TechCode who will forward the questions to me through WeChat. Uh, with that, I mean, Paul, there's a question just asked to the group about why would a company still want to come to, I guess, Silicon Valley? There's so many companies leaving. What's still the big draw here? Well, that's a really good question. And I think the answer today is different than it would have been a year ago or five years ago. 
Uh, yes, it's of course, it's very expensive, although a little less so now. Uh, it's very crowded. I think a lot of, I've, I've met so many companies that say, we just need to come to Silicon Valley, set up shop and things will be good for us. That, that's their mentality. And I say, no, that's not, that's not the case. This is such a crowded area to be in. It's so expensive and so competitive that I generally encourage companies, don't come here yet. You're almost certainly not ready. Take the time to do your research, do due diligence on yourself and on the markets that you're trying or, and the, the things you're trying to achieve by coming here and only then decide that it makes sense to come here. There are lots of other markets in the world that could be a better, a better fit for a first time expansion if, if that's where you're at. You know, Europe, of course, has lots of has big markets. Uh, I, were, I do a lot in Africa. And although there are some uh, unknowns about doing business in Africa, it's, there's a lot of opportunity there for South America and, of course, uh, Asia, India, and China in particular are gigantic opportunities. So I think it really comes down to what what's the purpose for coming here, and don't don't assume it's the right thing to do. Validate for yourself. Make a make a smart decision based on a widespread collection of information that coming here is the right thing to do. You may decide that if you have to come and get a name brand venture capitalist on board, a Sand Hill Road sort of firm, then you have to come here. Okay, that's a choice you make hopefully have the support of everybody, whether it's a board or shareholders or other investors, uh, and, and that every, anybody who needs to support you in coming here does so, because it's gonna take a lot. It is not easy to come across either the Atlantic or the Pacific to land in California and set up shop. It's just, there's so much going on. Like I said at the outset, how do you differentiate yourself from the crowd? Because no matter how unique you think you are, there's a virtual certainty somebody else is doing something pretty similar. And how do you attract attention to yourself? So the decision to come here is not just, well, it's Silicon Valley, everything happens there. The, uh, it should be more opposed as Silicon Valley has a lot going on. Is it a good fit for what we're trying to do or are there other markets where we could do better, take less risk, maybe realize less upside, but have a higher chance of success? Again, I've met so many, these delegations would come with all sorts of assumptions about how things work here. And I would be polite, but I would be firm in saying, what you think is not correct, you need to reconsider or you're really setting yourself up for failure. So be very deliberate. Again, you can never know too much about the market you're trying to enter. So I encourage that as an ongoing thing, not just preparation for a move. I guess to double click and go deeper on that even, when would it be too early to come here? When is it too late? Oh boy, I don't know if it's ever too late. It certainly can be too early. Too early would be when, boy, there's a whole list of things that would qualify you as being too early to come here. One is not having the requisite base at home, the foundation of revenue, uh, of uh, resource availability, whether it's cash or tolerance by a board uh, or whatever, or people to run the company back home while the CEO or the COO may be coming overseas to spend significant time here because that's what it often takes. Um, it could be not knowing enough about what you're trying to do, that's probably the most common cause of problems or failures is not knowing enough about the markets they're trying to enter and what it takes to do it and how persistent you have to be. There can be, again, any number of reasons to be too young to do something. Uh, as far as being too late to come here, that's, that's a different kind of question. I think if, you are, if you're in a dozen different countries and doing well, the United States, the US may seem like an afterthought and you might come here and maybe be less, less incentivized to, to work as hard as you would if you had only one other market that you're already in. I mean, there's, it's a big world. And if the product or service you offer can find a home in other markets, don't be afraid to, uh, to explore those. You know, again, there's nothing magical about Silicon Valley. There's a lot here that there isn't in other places, but it's not available to everybody. And if you decide you want something that's available only to a few, which again, might be like a name brand venture capitalist, you've really got to have a good story to tell if you're coming from overseas. Having said that, I have seen two Korean companies raise money in the last two years from Bay Area based venture capitalists. And so congratulations to them. They did a great job. So hey, Paul, with that, I mean, you've met many Korean companies and you just mentioned you saw two. What differentiated those two among the others that you saw? Well, I have to admit, I wasn't that optimistic about their chances, which shows what I know about predicting the future, uh, they were incredibly persistent. They would, they, would, they, they would travel 12 hours for a half hour meeting. I mean, these guys really, really uh, worked hard at getting attention. They, I remember they asked everybody they met, 
the questions, the kind of questions they needed answers to in order to formulate a strategy to do outreach. And I, when I saw them at CES in Las Vegas last year, they said, we did it. We raised, I think they raised $650,000, but because it came from a Bay Area based venture capitalist, it was more than just the money. And I think the persistence, they had a good story to tell. I, I didn't think their products were particularly that well differentiated, but that's not the only thing that matters. And I think the, the tenacity, the heart they showed, the willingness to commit, basically the, the people behind the desks listening to these guys' sales pitch were probably thinking, I'm not sure about what, what it means to have a Korean company in my portfolio, but if anyone's gonna succeed and apparently be willing to listen to do things differently, it looks like these guys. So I think they came here with, they knew enough to, to know the kind of presentations to make and the impact they wanted to make. And they just, I guess they came across as, we're not taking no for an answer. <laughs> so it was, again, something worked. I wasn't part of that process, but I do know that it worked and more power to them. I think they set a good precedent for Korean companies trying to expand to the US. Wait, Paul, you'd mentioned that they raised some capital here. What are the different types of funding and could you talk about how they each differentiate from one another? Sure. Well, there's four or five primary categories of money you can raise over here or anywhere. You know, of course, there's friends, there's bootstrapping and friends and family, which is keeping it close and going to people who might think you're crazy, but they know you, so they're going to give you a chance. That's not usually a significant amount of money, although in some cases it can be. Then you go up to the angel level. Angel investment communities are all over the world. Some are pretty mature and some are well-resourced. Others, not so much. And it can be hard to find them. They're often, there are some that are very, very well known, but others are a little more under the table or they're more cliquish. You know, they might be more of a group of friends who, I know a club up in, in uh, Davis, for folks who know about an hour and a half north and east, there's a big university there and a group of guys each put in $2 million, 25 of them put in $2 million each to make a $50 million angel fund that they just run like, like a poker game. And so there's things like that. It's not likely the average Korean company is going to meet people like that when they come here for a short time. But, but there are ways to find these angel networks. You just have to do your research. You know, you've got, whether it's LinkedIn or AngelList or Google or networking relentlessly, which nowadays, of course, is different. There are ways to find that. So after you've exhausted the angel or gotten your angel investment, then you start looking for institutional money, which might be venture investors, <clears throat> excuse me, who are interested in early stage ventures, depending where you're at. And of course, there's, I don't know the actual count, maybe you do, Sean, 1,500 venture firms in California, something like that. So there's an awful lot to choose from. So you've got to understand who, who invests in the kind of thing you're doing. If, you're, if you make AR, VR headsets, you're not going to go to a seed company, a company that invests in seeds for plants and crops. So you've got to have a match between what their portfolio consists of and what you're trying to offer. So they might actually think about including you in their portfolio. And there's a huge array of, of investors at that level. And then once you get some real traction, if you're going to go after rounds after that, say a full A round, then you're looking at investors who expect you to have revenue. They expect you to really understand the operation that you're running, to have expansion plans that are believable and defensible, and to have, in, in my mind, it's important to have international growth plans as well. The world is far too globalized now not to have some kind of global plan in mind the minute you sit down to talk to somebody, not to mention an exit. And you got to have to sort of cover the whole spectrum of the lifespan of the company you're trying to build when you're talking to somebody about getting involved, whether really, really early or in some kind of growth and scaling stage. And then after you get, let's say you get through an A and a B round, if you don't get acquired, then for real growth, of course, there's the private equity markets. There are family offices, which cover the whole gamut from early stage to large, large investments. At the vault once we had uh, a guy in, he was pretty low key about it. And he said, uh, we only write checks for a hundred million dollars or more. And I said, what is the name of this family office? And he said, Rockefeller. I'm like, okay, there aren't many like that, but he was out there looking. He was looking for cannabis is what he was looking for about three years ago. So, so that was quite something to encounter. So they are out there. But again, the only way a, a foreign startup is going to learn about these resources and reach them is, is either to be here or have a good proxy, a good partner here who is on the ground, who is well-connected, and who understands the way these communication channels work, who know people like you, Sean. You're a fantastic connector. If anybody on the phone, on, on the call doesn't know that, Sean is in the elite class of connectors and networkers. And he didn't even pay me to say that. That's a free compliment, Sean. Well, well basically, it's true. 
I, I know Paul and, and that's about it. So I just always defer everyone to him. But but with that, Paul, I got to ask. So you just mentioned all these types of investors. Some have, you know, write check size of 100 million. Others write checks that will fill a seed round up to, you know, half a million. All these investors are, I mean, they have to be different. How are you seeing the appetite or how are you seeing the personalities between investors maybe in Korea, China, and the U.S.? Well, to be honest, I don't know much about Korean investors. Uh, I do know a couple that I've I've chatted with casually. I've never actually worked with one. Uh, I assume they're focused on Korean opportunities. I mean, Korea has a ton of smart people and good companies, great opportunities. It's not an insignificant market. So you could probably do just fine with a Korea only portfolio. Uh, I've, I've worked with several Chinese investors. I think they have a very specific focus. Their criteria are perhaps a little a little narrower than what you might find in a VC here or over in, I don't know, maybe, maybe Germany. Again, there's no one size fits all when it comes to figuring out who's the right investor and in what country. I think in the US, the things that characterize investors here, well, for one, they don't have a lot of attention to, to pay, to, to devote to any one prospect in front of them. So you've got to have your story straight and know what it is they want to hear. And what investors here want to hear, um, Lots and lots of things. Again, I can't possibly list them all, but I would say it's a, a clearly articulated value proposition to the market. It's a, an establishment, a foundation, and a growth plan that realizes that value, that grows it to a level they care about. And investors here generally have pretty large numbers in mind when it comes to estimating a return. They don't look for 2x, 3x. Uh, they, want, they want big returns. So they want to hear that you're thinking big as well. One of the pieces of advice I give a lot of my startups that I mentor uh, and used to teach on a regular basis back when such things still happened in person is that a lot of folks would come here and say, I want to raise $250,000 as a seed round. And I would say, that's probably too little, whatever you're doing. And I said, keep in mind that asking for too little money is a much bigger problem than asking for too much money. If you ask for too much money, ask for a really big number, you can always work way down from that and arrive at an acceptable number. But if you start low, you're not going to negotiate up in any meaningful way. And so don't be afraid to ask for more than you think they're going to offer you. Make sure you know what you need. You've, you have a way you estimate what, what it is you've determined you need to, do, to undergo the growth you want to use this money for. Have a clear sense of how you're going to use it and be able to show that to an investor. So it's a combination of ambition, intelligence, planning, reality about the market you're going into and the risks that you face and how you're going to deal with them. You know, investors here can afford to be really discriminating because they see so many opportunities. I know investors in places like Romania and South Africa who, who don't have the richness of opportunity that we have here. So they've got maybe gentler criteria. But understand, if you're coming here to raise money from a, a U.S.-based investor, they're going to hold you to a pretty high standard because they see so many opportunities. As one example, uh, I once taught a class at a, a venture fund. Their office is down in, uh, in Palo Alto. And they were robotics. They really did only robotics. And I asked them as part of the class, I said, how many pitches did you see in 2019? And they said, in 2018, excuse me. And they said over 10,000 decks came in across our, across our servers. Nobody can possibly get a, gra- a grasp on that much material. Not Simply not possible. Only a machine can, and a machine doesn't make the final decision. So understand who you're trying to raise money from, what they want to hear, the kind of companies they've already invested in, and you'll have a much better shot at getting their attention in a positive way. But understand, they're going to hold you to a high standard. Make sure you are very well versed in what your value proposition is to present it, to be able to think on your feet when they start peppering you with questions, and and never try to bluff your way through an answer. They'll they'll see through that in an instant. Never want to do that. So it's there's a lot of cultural differences. Americans, of course, are expert at promoting themselves and talking about themselves in ways that a lot of foreign cultures just say, oh, we don't do that. Well, if you want to come here and, and try to succeed here, you've got to be like, a bit like when in Rome, do like the Romans. When in San Francisco, do like the San Franciscans. That's what you got to do. Now, speaking of that, what's kind of like a time horizon for people where they could expect to kind of receive capital from investors? Is this something where they arrive here, get off the plane, and there's a check for them? Or is there a process that it could be three months, six months, a year? What, is, what do things look like? I think in 1998, if you were selling pet food online, there might have been a check waiting for you at baggage claim when you fly to San Francisco, but not anymore. 
uh, those days are long gone. Investors now have been through boom and bust, enough boom and bust cycles in recent memory to, to be much more deliberate, much more discerning. And the average time to raise money varies pretty considerably. I would say coming here fresh, having to, if, let's say you've done all your research, you've got a great story to tell about your company back home. You have two years in the bank that you can afford to risk uh, on a venture coming to the US. I would say if you're starting from a cold start, one to two years minimum. I just don't see it happening faster than that. If you've taken the trouble to get properly networked and laid the groundwork uh, and have reached out and informed people what you're all about and you say, we're gonna come, we're gonna show you, we're gonna really run through our, our value proposition in great detail, you might get it in six to nine months. I think less than six months to raise money in any climate, especially nowadays with COVID still being creating so much uncertainty in the world. To have a six to 12 month minimum time horizon in mind makes sense. Anything less than that is just too optimistic. Anything, I've heard people say, we, we only have two months. How do we raise money in two months? I say, rob a bank maybe, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. So it's all about expectation and understanding the realities of the mechanisms you're trying to engage with. So with that, okay, so maybe a company doesn't have that much runway left, but they still wanna take their product to the US market what's the best way to go about doing it? Is it to get an office here? Is it to partner with someone? What are some recommendations to bring a product over from overseas here to the US market? Well, I think if a company has a product that's already on the market in Korea or wherever it is, if it's got some traction, if they understand what it takes to sell it, at least to Korean consumers, or again, wherever, what they need to do is understand how do such products land in the American marketplace? And for those who don't know, the US marketplace, no matter what it's in, whether it's novelty items or semiconductors or pharmaceuticals, there's very, very complex supply chains and, and marketing and distribution. There's getting something in front of a consumer is not just sticking it on, uh, you can do it, just put it on Amazon or on eBay or wherever you might be. But if you have a product that, that is, you wanna get in the hands of consumers and you wanna use the, the significant distribution resources this country has by going through the major retail chains or Again, whatever it is you happen to make, you've got to understand these things and understand that you don't just walk into Walmart and say, we make this awesome thing. You ought to buy 5 million the first year and they're going to fly off the shelves. You've got to understand how is a product or a service like you are, are offering? How does it make the market? Where does it hit the market? What's, what's the path it takes to get there? Uh, I used to be in the LED industry. I ran a, a business that did custom LED lighting design and the supply chains and the information chains and the delivery uh, mechanisms were so complicated. It's, there's just no way a startup can do it by themselves. So partnerships, finding distributors, finding manufacturing reps, finding sales teams, and there's lots of them out there. That's the only, really the only way to do it. And use that to gain some traction. A lot of folks tell me that, well, if we, if we have to go with somebody else's sales force, for example, then they're going to take a lot of the margin that we would otherwise get. And my response is always, yes, but they know what they're doing and you don't. So you can have 100% of a very small number, or you can have 25% of a much, much larger number and learn so that over time you can pull more of it back to yourself. I think a lot of, a lot of startups have a very DIY mentality, but if you're trying to address a major market, whether the US or Germany or India or China, you simply can't do it alone. So understand the nature of the partnerships that might make sense to you. Again, it could just be a, a, a marketing distribution contract with a distributor, or it could be a strategic partnership where you do an OEM or a license where no one knows your name, but as long as your technology or product is being sold every time inside somebody else's product and you get paid every time that happens, that can be a very lucrative way to go. I always put in a pitch for an IP based business because I think they are the most profitable and sustainable over, over decades, not quarters or years. So, so again, Sean, that's, that's probably the, the broadest answer of any question you're going to ask tonight. How does somebody access the U.S. market? There's so many ways to do it. And there's there's more ways to do it wrong than do it right. But there's never only one way. So keep in mind that there's a lot of research you need to do about these things. And I'm advising a Japanese company right now, and they make this high-tech additive. But it's just an additive way back in the value chain. And so we're talking about uh, joining technical societies and in university consortiums to meet the people who work in the companies who specify the materials that go into these products that then become other products. And, and they're overwhelmed because it's about a six step process to go from what they do to where somebody will actually pay for the final product. And that's something that 
a foreign company is just not going to know without fi finding ways to research it, meet people like myself, for example, or you, Sean, or perhaps the other speakers on tonight's panel. Because without it, there's just too much to learn in the time you have. I don't care if you have 25 years in the bank, you might do it, but that's not going to happen. So you had mentioned something there that really caught my attention. You said that, in your opinion, IP companies are the most profitable companies long term. Can you dive into that? Sure. <clears throat> IP is a whole bunch of things. It's patents, copyrights, trademarks. It's all sorts of, there's lots of forms of IP. I won't, I won't dwell on those. But let's say you have an, a good patent portfolio. And if you are able to, if your technology is good enough that others want to use it, uh, then you can license that to them and they pay you a royalty, which means they pay you for the right to use what you've done and that you get paid that royalty for as long as they sell that product and as long as you have the patents or other coverage to protect it. And the life of patent is 20 years from the date you file it. And the beauty of something like an IP portfolio, whether it's patents or copyrights or trade secrets or designs or masks or things like that, is that they have an infinite carrying capacity. And by that, I mean, if you have a factory that makes 10,000 cars a day, let's say Tesla can make 10,000 cars a day in their factory, you might ramp it up to 12,000 if you really piled it on and added more lines and added another shift. But there is an upper limit for sure. You're not gonna go from 10,000 to 100,000 anytime soon, not without building more factories. However, a patent portfolio, usually the way we look at this, but an IP portfolio has infinite carrying capacity. You can issue licenses to uh, the patents that you have all day long and the patent is not affected at all. It's always enforceable the same way. The same laws apply to everybody anywhere in the world if they're coming here. And it's, it's a resource that has a capacity that no other asset in a business could possibly touch. And that's the beauty of things like this. They're hard to get out in the market, but once they do, royalty revenue is very, very high margin money. And I can, I can speak from pretty extensive personal experience that once the CFO gets a royalty check, which means money comes in that you didn't really have to work for at that point, they're very fond of that kind of revenue. It's very, very high margin. You look at some of the best um, IP-based companies out there. Microsoft's a great example. You know, Google's a great example. There's things they do that nobody else can really do, or they've got the market coverage. And so, you know, when you subscribe to your Microsoft uh, Office package every year, you, know, you pay your 79 bucks every year, a, a significant portion of that goes straight to their bottom line. Now, Microsoft is gigantic, of course, but there's a reason they've been so profitable for so long with so many products that some folks don't think are that great. It's that we don't have a lot of other choice and the business model is such that you now pay an annual subscription fee, which is a licensing model. And uh, whether it's hardware or software or materials, uh, if anybody, and I'll just say that if anybody on this call wants to know more about this, please ping me anytime. I love talking about it. It doesn't cost you anything. I love advising companies with an IP basis. And when it's done right, it is the most lucrative business I think you can be in. And if you look at uh, some of the, the bigger success stories, look at Adobe, for example. Dolby has extraordinary margins um, on the revenue they earn because most of it is their IP, the name and the technology. Uh, it's Dolby's job to support the technology. It's others people's, other people's jobs to buy it and to resell it in cars and in, in phones and who knows where else Dolby is. So I'm always making a plug for an IP. If you have a technology that is protected or protectable by patents or other forms of IP, you should look into it, an IP strategy and an IP execution plan. Investors don't really understand IP that much. Some do. I work with some who do. But if you can tell a story around your IP and how it might gain some traction in the market that is completely different from the traction your product or service will offer, then I think you'll have a better story to tell. So again, anybody wants to know more about this, please let me know. I love those kind of conversations. So with that, we already have a question from the audience. Are there any companies that are private companies now that might go public in the future? or that are growing at a rapid rate that you really are impressed by their IP? Ooh, that is a good question. Uh, most of them are companies you would never have heard of. Uh, there's, I worked with a Finnish company that has really remarkable technology. Uh, they, make, uh, they make the waveguides for AR VR headsets, universal sign for VR headset there. And they, it's, it's a quantum leap forward technology. And it's really, really, um, unusual in the way they did it. And as license, as IP goes, it's tremendous because if and when VR headsets really take off as 
we keep hearing that they will, whether it's Oculus or wh whoever else. They don't seem to have done so yet, but I can't believe they aren't the future. And if, if these guys get their, their waveguides into every machine, they will be an extraordinary company. Um, I work with a Dutch company, I'm trying to think of foreign examples. I work with a Dutch company that started out 3D printing uh, lenses for lights, and they now make glasses. They now make glasses, and they've raised a lot of money. They have a fantastic IP portfolio, if I do say so myself, because I started it for them. And what's, what's really nice about them is they, in one fell swoop, they eliminated uh, the nature of the way you design uh, the lens on a light, because you now print each one rather than manufacture them all in a big, a big mold. So you're printing everything on demand. They eliminated design lockdown. They eliminated inventory. They, in fact, they, it was so innovative. It was such a great leap forward that I had people actually call me. Two people called me and said, we don't believe you can do this. It's too innovative. It's too innovative. Uh, if anybody wants to look, it's got a, a bit of an odd name. It's called LuxXL, L-U-X, Excel, like the software, Lux Excel in the Netherlands. And it, it really is a remarkable company. And they're now making, eye, they're printing eyeglasses, which will be the future. Think about how you get your glasses. They, they, they get the, the frames, and you get the, the lenses and they, they buff them and they sand them and they wear them down, no more. And you just hit a button, prints it out. Five minutes later, you got your glasses, you're good to go. If they don't work quite right, you print another lens. It's completely a radical, radically different way to manufacture something. And, and Paul, another question. How do you see the relationships in the startup ecosystem between Korea and Silicon Valley in 2021? Well, my crystal ball is in the shop, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd look right into it. But I'll let you know when I get it. Well, you, you should just print one out. I mean, geez. I, I wish I could. Someday. You watch. Someday. Uh, I think the uncertain nature of things, the only certainty is that the first half of 2021 is not going to be that much different than the last half of 2020. I just don't think it's, there's not gonna be much change. Certainly not here. Things, as everyone knows, the virus is out of control here and people are just, the markets are going great guns, really. But I think when it comes to travel and meeting people, things that we're still used to doing, although we are learning to adapt to a virtual environment, are still gonna be really, really hard. I think the best thing Korean companies of all, of all natures, whether it's a brand new startup company, excuse me, in growth mode or an established company can do is keep a presence here of some sort. Find, find somebody they can pay a small amount of money each month to keep an eye on the markets that, that they're interested in if they're not here already. If they are here, take a hard look at the expenses, the, the cost basis to be here, and whether it's worth doing it, whether the, in, the business you're in can grow under these conditions. We do now have 10 months worth of, nine months worth of uh, data, call it, experience living under lockdown and travel restrictions and all this. But in spite of that, there's been a lot of things that move forward. So I think, go back to what I said, first of all, you can never know too much about the markets you're in or you want to be in. So I think for 2021, keep a close eye on investment activity, on M&A activity, on things that clearly there's a lot of attention paying, focused on vaccines. Look at Moderna, what they've done. But there's a lot of other things that are related to crisis situations or to a mad scramble to do something differently than it used to be done, like Zoom. You know, a year ago, Zoom was like, yeah, it's a video communications. It's great. Today, it's almost like a Kleenex. It's almost like a generic noun for something that we all take for granted that is going to be the way we communicate. And so it's hard to predict the future, but you can certainly be less surprised by it if you keep close track of what's going on around you. And that just involves constant flow of information, knowing what you're looking for, and the ability to tease out the data that matters to you to make better decisions. And with that, Paul, we're running out of time. Is there any last things you want to mention to the audience before before we end the show? And is there a way that anyone can find out more information about you? Sure. I'll post my contact info in the chat window. I think my advice to anybody, Korean or otherwise, is that the U.S. technology ecosystem can always use and should always welcome smart, motivated, ambitious people from abroad. That's what makes this country what it is, is bringing in smart people from other places to make things better. So I personally welcome anybody who wants to come here and try to make their mark if they do it the right way, as we've talked about tonight. I think people who are deliberate, who are realistic about their chances and who are diligent about their processes stand a better chance of success. And if I can help to be part of that for anybody on the phone tonight, that would be great. So I'd say to everybody, stick with it and best of luck. And thanks again to you, Sean, for putting this together. Really, really appreciate it. 
Thank you, Paul. And I also want to thank all the other speakers tonight, Sam Wong, Matthew Lewis, Piero Scruffy, everyone that has contributed and shared their wisdom and knowledge with our global audience, our Korean audience, our Chinese, our Silicon Valley, everyone. So uh, with that, uh, people's contacts were left in the chat. If anyone still needs that, uh, please contact either your tech code contact who's mess messaging me over WeChat, or we will keep the Zoom on for a little bit, even though the event is now officially over. We'll keep the Zoom on if anyone wants time to take things from the chat. And with that, I want to thank everyone from Tech Code and everyone have a good night. All right. Cheers.